Oh, yeah. nobody wants to know what Ben's gonna be, I guess, for Halloween. We already got my mic check. But I told you uh, yesterday I'm gonna but, be David and work from home. Okay. David never works from home. I know, he did one day last week, though. Uh, for half the day. Yeah. I told him, we came back on Friday and said, you should do that more often. And then corrected myself and said, you could do that more often. Like, now that we don't want to be here. Yeah. Well, now that calf season is gone. Calf season is has passed. Um, this will be admissible in court, probably. <laughs> the long-time harassment over his exposed calves. My attorney's <laughs> That's probably as good a time as any for us to go ahead and start this episode of the Video Reformation episode Podcast. Episode 16? Episode 16, I believe. Look at us. Episode 16. Yeah, lucky, lucky 16? Mm-hmm, sweet 16. Sweet 16, there it is. Mm-hmm. This is our sweet sixteen episode. So just had our quinceanera. Yeah, that was that was a couple weeks that ago. That was fifteen. Two weeks ago, we should have recorded an episode <clears> from <throat> San Francisco. It would have been fun. We were busy. Yeah, we had a lot. Yeah, going on. We did. All right. So before we jump into our topic today, which is building in-house video teams, which I think will be an interesting discussion. Um, I believe we have a new sponsor this week. Do you want to just let us know who that is, and then we'll get to their ad later? Yeah, sure. Well, um, well, that our sponsor this week is Cozy Tozies. Cozy Tozies, yeah. Welcome to the cast, Cozy Tozies. Uh, They'd like to welcome you, our listeners. Yeah, yeah. So thanks for joining us, and thanks for thanks to Cozy Tozies for letting us keep doing this every, uh, every other week. Without our sponsors... We'd be just a boring podcast about video stuff. All right. <clears throat> so, on to today's topic. Um, building an in-house video team. <clears throat> I guess my first question to you would be, why might a company want to build an in-house video team? Because video is becoming such a, like a, a staple in B2C, B2B, any type of business. We've seen that shift happening a lot lately. They can range in size, but it just makes sense. Just like a lot of companies have web developers on staff and have copywriters on staff. As you start to use those things a lot more in your business, you start to bring that in house. You know, it kind of starts out there in the field and the fringes and works its way in. Yeah, well, and I think that now so many companies have seen the return that they can get from their video content, and so they feel like they need to be doing more of it. I think bringing your video in house largely helps you create more content faster and cheaper. And so I think it's probably the kind of thing that companies who've had success bringing in outside people to help them make video, the video has worked. And so they realize they need to do more of it. It's not necessarily that it needs to be better or it needs to be, you know, better. It just, they just need to have more of it. And so I think it just makes sense at some point to bring somebody in. And today we're gonna discuss what three different versions of that may look like. I, I would argue that better could, like from a consistency standpoint, better could yeah. be one, you know, a reason to do it in house as well. Yeah, that's true. If you're working with a variety of freelancers, every editor's got a different style, every, you know, director, shooter, all that kind of. Well, and, and we've even. Unpredictability. We've, yeah, we've even put together <clears throat> uh, video branding packages for clients and they don't distribute them properly to their freelancers and so they don't end up getting used so yeah if you've got that all under one roof there is ultimately and i think at least on on my suggestions on the kind of people you bring in for these different levels of teams ultimately there's one person responsible for the quality of the content that's going out and so yeah i do think that consistency is is a part of it so consistency volume speed speed cost Cost. You just keep saying words, and I'm going to repeat them. A <laughs> well, little I mean, louder. but all those are different levers you're going to have to play with and figure out what what do you need. And and, and I think creating regularly scheduled content <laughs> would be for me as a business owner would be the deciding factor for me. If I knew that I was going to be churning out content on a regular basis, it's a whole lot easier to take that risk and bring someone in house. I mean, we've even seen it, right? I mean, we started with a vision of, of this company as as never having anybody in-house. It was always gonna be freelancers. Yeah. Because you just bring them on by job and, and that makes sense. But once you get to that kind of critical mass- With a volume. With a volume of work, it actually makes more sense from a 
project management standpoint, from a consistency standpoint, and and then from a cost standpoint to have people on staff mm-hmm. to do those kinds of things. Um, and so it, it, it makes sense for an in-house team too. What are some of the disadvantages of bringing video in-house? And I, and I guess one question before that would be, when we're talking about bringing video in-house, are we talking about building a team or are we excluding any external partners and doing everything, every part of everything in-house? I don't think you can expect to do every part of every project in-house. Mm. I mean, you like even as it go- comes down to like equipment, you may need special lighting for a certain thing. Like when you build an in-house team, you're gonna buy equipment and software and all that kind of stuff too. At some point, you're gonna need something that you don't have. And so the renting cameras, getting someone else on, an audio person on set, stuff like that, mm-hmm. you're gonna, it, it's gonna change uh, on every production or unless you're doing the same content every time. Um, what was the, what was the question? So that, well, yeah, so that, that, was, that was kind of the question that needed to be posed first is- Oh, inside, outside. Inside, outside, is it exclusive? Right. I don't know, and I agree with you. I don't think it ever can be exclusive. Um, but what are some? What might some of the disadvantages be of an in-house team? I think of uh, honestly, I think of one off the bat, and maybe it's just a little, maybe it's a little cynical. But I worry about quality when I hear people bringing someone in-house mm-hmm. to do video, and I, I think it's with the smaller teams more where yeah. they're bringing one person in. Um, I, I think that's a concern that that I have with clients, prospects, just people in our network who are bringing someone in. Mm-hmm. Uh, even even clients and prospects that they already have one person in. There might be one thing that they're good at. Mm-hmm. They might be good at documentary style. Right. But because that's what their experience is in, but they have no experience with any kind of scripted content. And so what you see is a whole bunch of the same doc style type content without any, any variety in the content. Mm-hmm. And so I think that gets a little limiting sometimes. Yeah. What else might be a disadvantage of... I, I'm trying to come from our listeners point of view um some of them if they're listening to this and they're they're considering bringing video in house i'm sure one of their concerns is cost why like does it make sense to even have this person around or these people around or can we just go out and get it when we need it and that just i think that comes down to are you dedicated to using video or are you not uh you've got to make that decision before you bring somebody in house. Sure. Otherwise it will be a waste of money. Be, being an in-house video person in my past, I mm. found that it's not always my only responsibility. Mm-hmm. Um, and so other things would get handed to me and video projects tended to slip. And so they weren't getting done faster. Mm-hmm. They were getting done cheaper. That's interesting. Um, they're getting more and they're getting it cheaper, but it wasn't happening faster, if that makes sense. I don't know if it's a disadvantage, but it's certainly a concern is when you bring your video in-house, you've got a you're responsible for managing that entire process. Mm-hmm. So if you're used to your video partner, video vendor, whatever, you know, writing scripts and making creative suggestions and you know, casting and and all of those pieces that we've discussed in prior episodes are a part of making video. You've got to either rely on that person or people you're bringing in to handle all of that, or that's an additional thing that you're going to have to put on your own plate Mm -hmm. is making sure that the scripts are done Mm -hmm. and on time and the right. And so there's a whole project management producer responsibility that until you get to a team of a certain size, it's probably something that's gonna end up falling on your plate as the person in marketing or sales mm-hmm. or whatever who's responsible for you know, managing that video team, individual person or small team, either way. So I don't know that it's necessarily a disadvantage, but it is something that I would strongly consider as you're building a team is you know, trying to get the, an honest assessment of the capabilities of the people you're bringing into the team. We're going to talk a little bit about what each of us think are the important roles, but I think probably just hiring in general, uh, the people who are really good at hiring are good at, at understanding you know, what, what the people they're hiring are good at and what they aren't necessarily so good at. And if they're not necessarily good at it, it doesn't mean it doesn't have to be done. It means that you're probably going to have to do yeah. it. 
Um, so it may just take a little bit longer, especially if you're less familiar with video. You may need to let your interviewees lead you a little bit on what they see as the whole process and what part they can, what part they're good at. Um, and so there is a little bit of a risk there. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that's also why, you know, the the different size teams you can also bring on one person, let that work for a while, mm -hmm. and then and then once you kind of get into a rhythm and and know what that person's capabilities are, then you can build in those other pieces around it. So you can go from like a one person team to a three person team to like a full in house team. Um, and that's one trajectory you can take. And then, you know, you could also be at a company that's of a certain size where you need to go ahead and start with a three person team because you've got two or three vendors that you're used to working with. And you're just going to say, it's time to go, you know, in house. Mm -hmm. We're going to need three people to put on this team. So, a couple different ways to look at what we're going to, the recommendations we're going to mm -hmm. make in this episode. Okay, so um, any other advantages or disadvantages of building an in-house sure. team or, or why? <laughs> I'm sure there are. Um, why don't we jump into uh, kind of the the starting point for a lot of in-house video, which would be bringing in kind of a one-person uh, team. How would you... So, for context, we're going to discuss the personnel required, which obviously a one-person team means you're bringing in one person. But I think you and I probably have slightly different, as we go on, we'll have more different sure. ideas of what that skill set should be. We're also going to talk about the tools that you need to give that person and that that person needs to, to be able to have access to and to use. Mm -hmm. um, so if you've got one person that you're bringing into an in-house team, what do you want that person to be? Um, so yeah, we've got a one-person team three person and then full in house, whatever that looks like. Um, for each of those though, I've kind of drawn a line. I think there's, uh, there's companies who need one in house person that are like with really high expectations and then need high quality content, video content. Mm -hmm. And then I think there's some who are just kind of dabbling and kind of need content period. Okay. Um, and I'm thinking of, um, obviously, Tesla is bigger than uh, some of the parameters we've set around this one-person team. But like, you know, they have a, they don't even produce commercials, right? They don't advertise, but they produce a lot of content. Um, but they need that content to be of a certain caliber. So um, my guess is they don't have full in-house capabilities, but they probably have like at least a producer someone who can like manage that project mm -hmm. so i've so for the one person team most companies that are looking at bringing video in house are probably looking uh for someone who can write shoot and edit their their quality expectations are probably um not as high as tesla um so that writer shooter editor someone who can do all three of those things um i feel like most of the time in that in that one person team uh that writer shooter editor is usually shooter editor mm -hmm. doesn't do a whole lot of writing yep uh and that's just given the time constraints uh expectations set from the beginning um and so that that is one of the drawbacks i think uh, of having that writer shooter editor one person low quality expectations is if your expectations are low <laughs> you're probably gonna get low quality work mm -hmm. to some degree. You know, it may be just what you need. But if it's consistent. Yeah, it, that it, is an advantage. It, and, and if there's <clears throat> a lot of it, then. Yeah, that's what you need, I, yeah. You know, and, and especially if it's lower in the funnel too. I mean, we've talked before about how it's the, the, the higher in the funnel you go, the bigger your budgets generally need to be, the higher the production quality needs to be. So if you've identified strategically that your best opportunity for volume of video content is lower in the funnel, it can be scrappier, which is our nice way of saying cheaper. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I, I think I'm, so there's a Venn diagram of, of your choice and my choice where the intersection is on the shooter and the editor. I came at it from shooter editor with 
some basic MoGraph skills um, as opposed to a writer because I also wanted to take into consideration who's on the team. So let's marketing is usually the biggest example. I'm sure there are opportunities where a sales team could be bringing in a video producer. A customer success team could be bringing in a video producer. But I think the most accessible uh, opportunity and example is on marketing teams. So my assumption is if you're at a point where you're considering bringing video in-house, you've probably got at the very least a copywriter on staff. Yeah. You've probably got a graphic designer, creative director, they may be the same person, but those things are probably there because of the other content that you're producing. Mm-hmm. Even anywhere from brochures to website copy to anything. Yeah, right? to anything, to, yeah. to paid ads, to social posts. I mean, you know, so, so I think all of these levels of in-house teams need to work with the rest of the existing team that's there. Mm-hmm. But for the one person team, if there's a copywriter on staff already, then we can train that person how to write for video. There are some mm-hmm. different things that you need to consider when you're writing for video because you get to show and tell oftentimes. Um, so we can take that person and if they're a good copywriter, get them to understand what they need to do differently when they're writing a video script. And then if I'm if I'm bringing in someone who's got experience shooting and editing, then uh, to me that's the core. And where you went writer as kind of the next part of that, I went MoGraph. And it doesn't even need to be that they need to know After Effects, for example. Mm-hmm. They need a basic design sense mm-hmm. so that they can quickly put together titles some nice looking titles you know ctas that are easy to read if it's you know you're considering mobile and so it's a thicker text than not a thinner text just it's almost more about like the eye for that kind Mm -hmm. of thing than than the technical ability to do anything fancy Mm -hmm. with motion graphics because you can i mean you can get if you're using one of the tools i would suggest that this person have is um Premiere, yep, uh, Adobe Premiere or Final Cut Pro 10, and yeah, and but you don't even both of those. You don't even you don't need After Effects or something right. high powered because there are a lot of title templates that can plug yep. right into either of those programs. Yep. So it may cost you fifteen dollars to get a title pack, and now you've got your your video branding <laughs> yeah. taken care of for yep. now. But yeah, that, that is one thing that I think is often overlooked, I think you just mentioned that a second ago too, is that whole branding, video branding, yeah. it's a whole different animal than than all the other branding that you've currently got. So if you're just starting out with video and you've got a beginner, like a, you know, maybe this person has a lot of experience but as a one man band, they're probably not suited to create your video branding. Um, that could get a little choppy and scary for a while, but mm-hmm. just start to figure things out. I think simpler is better in that regard. But, but if I if if I if I think to back to when I was a one man band freelancer, if I had been brought in at a, at a company and responsible for video, I wouldn't have had any problem working with their graphic designer mm-hmm. or creative director to have them graphically lay out what mm-hmm. I'm supposed to do, and I can figure out how to put that into a animated video, in or something. right how to animate it in <laughs> yeah. and, and whether it's whether it's taking like an adobe illustrator image mm-hmm. and, or, or just them giving me a reference with like the hex code for the colors sure. right like i i could probably figure that out yeah to to the point where your creative director your graphic designer is still saying this is what this needs to look like yep. but that person doesn't know how to put it onto a timeline right. in one of those editing programs and that editor may not know how to design it so the two of them coming together can make it work but again that's kind of why i went with like just that basic eye for sure. MoGraph. you can still run it by the graphic designer or say hey give me something cool and then you know oftentimes less is more yep. on animations anyway so might as well just keep it simple and and like you said so much and, and in fact i didn't include we'll get to tools next i didn't include after effects until we get to the three-person team right as a part of the tool that's necessary because all that necessary. stuff is just built in it's more than you need okay so we basically agree that it's someone who's got experience and skills as a shooter editor and then if they've got writing experience that's a bonus if they've got some basic MoGraph, that's a bonus mm-hmm. either way you go there and then of course ideally if you've got someone who's got some writing experience i you know we 
Um, <clears throat> we also are very big on hiring good writers. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that, that I would do wherever I was. Um, because someone who can write well, even if they're not writing for you, it means they can form their thoughts well, mm -hmm. right? They can explain themselves. Mm -hmm. And the better they can do that, the better they're gonna, the easier it's gonna be to work with them. Mm -hmm. um, and so even if you don't have somebody who's gonna be doing the writing, or if you've already got a writer, hire the better writer anyway. Mm -hmm. You don't even have to ask for a writing sample necessarily. If there's a there's cover letter emails, involved, yeah. or you know, read, read through What's a whole bunch of their emails. Like? How well do they communicate? That's and, a good read into, can they actually form thoughts yeah, yeah. coherently, yeah. yeah. Okay, so let's talk about some of the tools that this one person team needs. I'll go ahead and start with cameras. Yep, I think a simple DSLR, whether that's micro four thirds or Nikon or can I don't care necessarily, whatever they're comfortable with. Yeah, I, I, I've got it as like, you know, obviously they need one camera. Yeah. Two would help. Two would help. Two is 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 more than twice as good as one when yeah. it comes to cameras more because twice, yeah. you've got the opportunity to be more creative with your edit when you've got multiple um, uh, angles, angles mm -hmm. to switch back and forth from. Another thing to consider there because it's just so prevalent now is if they're 4K cameras, you can almost get four angles out of two cameras mm -hmm. because anybody listening to this doesn't need to be delivering any web video content in 4k yeah. you can deliver in 1080 so if you're shooting in 4k that means you've got the opportunity to punch in uh, to zoom in uh, on that 4k shot and not lose any resolution at 1080p so if you've got two 4k cameras for your one person team then they basically got at least four angles that they can choose from a DSLR is enough, you know, one of the mirrorless cameras, like a, I think the A7S II is a mirrorless. Um, even the Blackmagic, like pocket cinema cameras, mm -hmm. um, they've got a relatively new one that's out that's like a 6K Canon EF mount pocket cinema like camera. A which bucks. 2,500. But, oh, okay. um, uh, but the old pocket cinema camera is like 995 or yeah. something like that. So, um, so, yeah, one camera is a must, two cameras opens things up quite a bit um along with camera you gotta have a tripod one that's for, true one for each. I, yeah i didn't even put tripod on here but, but that it, is true it, it does not have to be spectacular right you don't have to be moving cameras they just need to be stable yep so tripods are good for that yes that is true <clears throat> what about lighting i think you gotta get i think you gotta give your person a three-point led lighting setup yeah um at this point, if you're buying gear for your person, then I would just go with a uh, a bicolor LED, three lights. Um, we can put some examples in the show notes of this stuff. Yeah, um, uh, the light panels are great. ICANs work. Um, there's so much out there right now. It doesn't have to oh, be God. I'm, super. It's probably a new Japanese company every day making yeah. them Chinese, and they're just ripping off whatever <laughs> everyone else's uh, IP. But um, yeah, if you if you give your video person three lights, then they can do basic three point lighting, um, which means if they're doing a basic interview setup kind of thing, they can set the key light, the fill light, and the hair light, um, and they can make, you know, they can make that work. And then I suppose mm -hmm. along the lines of tripods, you need to get stands. For yeah, however lights. that needs but, to work. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So that'd be three light stands. Yeah, three light stands for your three LED lights. What so about what you had? Huh? Is that what you had? Uh, I didn't have a three point. I just said some basic, but I probably would have ended up there if yeah. I kept developing that microphone. Yeah, I think you got to give them a, a lav, which is a lavalier microphone, a shotgun cordless mic. cordless lav. It yeah. doesn't have to be, but it would cer it wireless. certainly wireless lav help still if have it's wires, wireless. So. <laughs> Yeah, they That's do, misleading. but but there's a there's a transmitter and a receiver, right? So there's no wired connection between the recorder or the camera and the talent, so they can move around. So if you're getting one, you might as well get one that's wireless. Uh, the Sennheisers are really nice. G3 uh, or something like that. Yeah, G3 EW3, uh, whatever it is. The Sennheisers are nice. Um, it's nice to have uh, a shotgun too. Yeah, a shotgun is is. You're gonna get better audio. A must. Um, 
in fact, you're probably, if you had to choose one, I think you're better off with a shotgun than a lav. But again, I think just give give your in-house video person the option. Um, a lav the nice thing about the lav is that it just connects to this person talking. Um, the boom just requires more equipment. <laughs> yeah, and and if uh, and again, the, the if you've got a one-person team and they're using a shotgun mic, they're going to have to put that, that boom arm on a stand. Mm-hmm. And if that talent is moving around at all, that talent can't move around at all <laughs> because they're going to walk away from the mic yep. and it's going to sound kind of like this does right now. Yeah. Like as they get further and off axis from the mic, it's going to sound terrible. Whereas if they've got a lav, then no matter where they move, the mic is eight inches from their mouth. And their mouth is where their sounds come from, as I understand <laughs> the it. The ones you want to record. <laughs> yeah. And, um, uh, and yeah, so, and, and having both is, is again, uh, just more flexibility. Um, depending on the camera you've, you're getting, um, you may want to have an audio, a separate audio recorder. Um, there are also some preamps that you can get that then <clears throat> route the audio directly to the camera itself, which would take out a step of, of syncing audio uh, for the editor. But if they've got any experience, they're probably used to uh, yeah. syncing audio at this point anyway. So a separate audio recorder is going to be better noise floor um, than what you're going to get straight into the camera anyway. So your audio will sound better. And as we've discussed many times before, audio and video is hugely important. Um, so the quieter you can make that noise, um, the better it's going to sound. That really is about it for equipment. Yeah, um, we've discussed Premiere Pro or Final Cut Pro 10. Um, and then I think it, you got to get this person a computer with at least 16 gigabytes of RAM um, and a, a decent GPU. <laughs> yeah. yeah, they're going to need a computer to edit this stuff. <laughs> it's not film that's coming out of these cameras and they're, they're offline editing. So, um, you know, a decent uh, decent amount of RAM and a decent GPU are, are what's going to make things fast for them. They could work with anything, um, but, you know, the slower the computer, the the harder it's going to be to uh, to get stuff done on time. Mm-hmm. So if we're talking about a volume of content and consistent, you know, consistently publishing content, got to be able to hit those deadlines. Um, that's all I had for, for the one-person team. Do you have anything else to consider for them? No, but I just wanted to touch on that, like higher quality role, because that that's like for most of our listeners is probably where they're. What we just talked about is probably what they're trying to accomplish. Mm-hmm. But I could see uh, a company like one of our like our one of our clients from the Bay Area, you know, like their their Series D kind of company. They've raised you know they're valued at a billion dollars. You may you may not want that low value, low quality type of content as much. Uh, and you may only rely on, you may only want high quality, but you only have enough room in your marketing team for one person. I think it's it's about getting someone who's got, who they probably had agency, a lot of agency experience as a producer, know how to hire crews. They know how to put together timelines, budgets, all that kind of stuff. I think it's, I think if they're gonna be building some in-house team at all, and they have really high expectations, they need that Uber producer who's probably got five years agency producing experience. Because I could see, I, I know what you're talking about in terms of like top or bottom of the funnel, but I feel like there's, if, if, you, if you just need content at the top, then that's more likely you need to hire that producer person for a one-man band. Mm-hmm. Thoughts? Well, would that make that a two-person team then? No, I would, because you, well, Interesting. Because I brought a producer in at the three-person team. Yeah, that's right. I, I mean, I've got one there too. I don't know. Yeah, no. I, I, I think. I think if you're only shooting stuff for the top of the funnel. If I wanted to agree with you, I would say that that yes, even if you're bringing video in-house uh, or you're hiring someone full-time to be your one-person video team in-house, you're going to still have to rely on outside people. And so you're going to want someone in-house to have that production capability, um, that producer capability <clears throat> to manage those things. 
if I wanted to disagree with you, I would say that the person that we're speaking to who's considering this decision right now is probably used to doing that already and, and being the person who has worked with their vendors um, and so probably has enough experience to continue the existing vendor relationships they have, even if they're bringing in someone in-house to do some of the more volume kind of stuff. Um, so I think there's a way to do uh, to do the one the one person team as a way to add volume and um, timeline wise consistent content. Mm-hmm. Um, but going back to the beginning of the conversation, you know, I, I don't think it's exclusive of working with with other partners for that higher quality mm-hmm. stuff too. So, so I, I just you know. If you're going to be producing high high quality content, you're, one person's not going to be able to do that for you, and so you probably need to look into more of the three person team level, mm-hmm. which is what we'll discuss next. Mm-hmm. After we hear from our sponsor. All right. So, uh, an unfortunate thing, you know, when the storm came in, was that two nights ago, Sunday night? Or do we have rain? Sure. We left the windows open right next to our big, we have a bunch of letters and like fan mail and stuff. And we had a new sponsor package. It was kind of buried in there. We didn't really get a chance. So all the copy got wet. This is what they pay the big bucks for. Yeah. Well, I mean, we didn't follow up with them or anything, but there was the money in there and everything. So we're, we're doing, you know, holding up our end of it. So cozy toesies. Canadian loonies, which I thought was a little, a little <laughs> Very odd. heavy. Yes. Very heavy to send. That could have yeah. saved a lot. Of money and we could have got a lot more if yeah, they just we, we do accept wire transfers yeah yeah but it's this weird i can't quite figure out it's like a sleeping bag for your foot it's kind of this um maybe we can describe it to our listeners here this one happens to be black but there were other colors so it here. looks like a sock yeah you could say that to me it's just a sock oh well maybe put it on give it a little where do i put it on do I put it on my ear? That's what I'm What's unaware the name of. the company? Cozy Toesies. Cozy Toesies. What if I put it on my foot? Well, that's where I've been wearing it. Oh, you've been wearing it. Well, yeah. then I definitely want to put it on. Yeah, 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 yeah. Here, give it a try. Okay. <laughs> Taking then, off my shoes. Yep. And just... Uh, Taking off the socks I already have. Oh, you are You have these two? Yeah, look. Mine are, mine are red, white, and blue. Those are cool. Yeah. And now I'm putting on this previously worn sock looking <laughs> thing. Oh yeah, people are watching. And uh, over the over, over, over the So sock. you have another oh my s- sleepy. God. My toes are so cozy right now. Yeah. Wow. You're like dripping right like just oozing into your foot. Yes, my feet sweat. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, so it's a sock. It's is a what sock. it is. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But it makes your toes cozy. Right. It makes them fall asleep. Oh, I see. Yeah, you feel that? Like so like comatose? Comatose. <laughs> <laughs> you should have came up with that name. That was that was a good one, Ben. Thanks. Uh, All right. So I'm gonna put it back on my I'm gonna Yeah. Uh, your t- your toes look cold from here. It was. Now I can't feel them. Anything else in that uh, ad? Uh, that's about it. <laughs> yeah. So, thanks to Cozy Toes and their special Coma Toes line <laughs> of socks. I get it. Apparently, they're socks. Nowhere on here does it say sock. Well, it, I, we are so fortunate to have Cozy Toes thank as you. our new sponsor. Thank you. Uh, thank you for making socks. Um, okay. So, let's talk um, about a three person team. All right. Uh, who are you going to put on this three-person? Um, I, I guess, let me ask this first. Are you building this three-person team as a later version of the one-person team, or is this from a, I got to bring in a decent-sized team to from the beginning here? I'm bringing this in-house. Uh, I'm going to bring in, I got budget to bring in three people. Who do I bring in? Yeah. I, 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 again, kind of split that. I feel like you could go in two different directions. You could go to, like, okay, we've just went public, and now we need to have this, like, legit team in here. So, do, you know, maybe more of that top of the funnel stuff. 
And then I've got a just a grown up version of the one man band. Okay. Um, I so for that that maybe the lower expectations or lower part of the funnel. I think that kind of jives. Um, I originally had a writer shooter editor. In this, I want to take a moment and just make sure that everyone understands that when you're saying lower expectations, you don't mean bad. Mm-mm. You just mean not shot on a sound stage with a cast of a dozen people. Exactly. And you may not even have actors. Crew. Yeah. You're using people from inside the company, but it's still quality content. It's just the production value isn't a Tiffany's commercial. Yes. Okay. Um, but good point. So I, I, I took that writer, shooter, editor, and broke that up into three people. Okay. I understand the value of having, because I know you said you put producer on that list. Mm-hmm. I understand that the value of that, and I, I, in my head, that responsibility of that producer just transfers to the manager on, who, under whom this team works. Okay. And it's, it's about kind of making sure that they're in budget uh, timelines are hit, quality standards are met, um, and then making sure that the team's working well together. Sure. So, I mean, those are, those also, so a lot of times people talk about editors as being the last writer. Well, you've heard that before. I think you, and, that's where I heard it. Uh, yeah, I think I coined it. No, I mean, okay. I, I'm not, I'm well, not going to say that nobody's editor. <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to say. I've said it before. I've said it for a long time. And, I don't know that I've heard anybody else say it. I'm not yeah. claiming I made it up, but uh, um, I do feel that way. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. Uh, well, in, in the same way, I feel like obviously the writer is the first writer, uh, mm-hmm. but the shooter, director, that combination, that production experience, they also have an opportunity to write this piece. Um, and sometimes it happens during pre-production as they work with the writer. Uh, sometimes that happens during production. Um, sometimes that happens during post. What I'm getting at is all three of these roles, they have to be good at communicating. Mm-hmm. Those are all like, the, because they're all opportunities to write the, the final piece. Um, you know, I feel like each of those people, the writer, shooter, editor, if you have those three, they should be working together through pre-production production and post yeah i think i think it's important that and they're probably going to need to because they'll need someone to hold the boom or or you know hold the movie as someone's directing or whatever it is um so it's a very it's a very tight team they work together almost on everything um you can obviously split them off and do work on multiple projects at any given time but um some projects are going to require a lot more pre-production and that maybe includes a lot of you know the shooter and writer up front working together that director shooter um sometimes it's more post-production heavy but it should flow kind of have a nice flow to it Mm -hmm. so i think i think it's uh, as i look at my list i think it's interesting that that what i did was assume that everyone we're hiring is a good writer (laughs) so I kind of came at it from a place, uh, I, I guess subconsciously, because I don't have a writer actually designated as a person on this team until we get to like the full in-house team, and I have six roles for that. <laughs> um, but uh, yes, I, so I believe that every person that you should hire should be a good writer. I still think that if you've got a copywriter, if you're hiring a three-person video team, you've got a big enough marketing team that you've got a writer or some writers. You can still work with them. Um, I've got a diff, kind of a different, I mean, I, I lumped together, how do I want to say this? If I were hiring three people, I would want them to be as um, multi-talented as possible. Mm-hmm. So the first role that I've identified for this team is a producer, director, creative producer, which I think it's kind of like producer plus director equals creative producer. So someone who's got the experience managing projects, making sure that, you know, uh, creating budgets, running budgets, um, keeping all the stuff going, making sure that 
extras are cast or going through the whole casting process with a talent agent or finding a location or whatever. Like Maybe someone who's got, run a small, small production, like a two-person production yeah, company yeah. kind of thing. Yeah, or, or been a producer at an agency or a project yeah. manager at an agency yep. maybe. Um, and so, but they also, but it, they're not just a producer, but they're the person who knows I got to get craft services uh, for this shoot, or I got to book the studio for these three days so that we can do it. Like just the person who knows all of those like project pieces that have to happen. But I also want that person to, to have the ability to be a director on set. In certain, so they need to have a, that's why I end up kind of calling it a creative producer because they're the one who knows how to get all the little things done leading up to and, and during the shoot but they're also working with the rest of the team like you said throughout the whole process mm -hmm. to help define the creative concept and revise the scripts and and so this is a very um a very collaborative team still at three people so i've got my producer kind of <clears throat> primary producer but also ability to be a director and so i call that a creative producer i'm not sure who else is on this list but that person should probably get paid the most <laughs> yes that person should definitely get paid the most um and then i've got my um my director slash shooter mm -hmm. slash maybe editor so like it this could be the person who was your one person team after a couple more years of, of experience. So they're not just a shooter editor, but but they take that experience editing because anybody knows that the best director, well, people in this field know that the best directors are those who, who shoot for the edit. Mm -hmm. so, so if you've got experience as an editor, you're gonna be a better director. So this is the person who on probably 75 or 80% of the shoots you're doing is probably directing. They're probably also working the camera. And then they've got some editing abilities, if not only for um, how they direct, but also depending on the capacity, because your other guy is kind of the, or, or girl, is the editor motion graphics person. So you've got a dedicated post-production person, mm -hmm. basically, a dedicated on-set person, and then a at the top of it is a person who just makes sure all of it, all of it comes together. Mm -hmm. So that's how, that's how I would do it, is that kind of creative producer, a director shooter with editing ability, and then an editor motion graphics person. And this is the point where I would bring <clears throat> After Effects ability mm -hmm. into that. For sure. So it's, it's, you know, it's probably Premiere or Final Cut, and it's, and it's After Effects or Apple Motion. Um, but that one person has, you know, your, your director, shooter, editor doesn't need to have any of those MoGraph capabilities, but your post-production person can do the editing and the motion graphics. So, as you know, I've built two teams, and that, the more experienced team for uh, option okay, two yeah. is exactly what you just said. Yep. Um, for those who can't see, Justin's holding up a piece of goldenrod paper. Um on which he has written his ideas for this episode, and he showed me <laughs> exactly what was on that page. Um, which was which was exactly producer, what I just director shooter yeah. and MoGraph editor. Yep. And that person, that MoGraph editor, I've got them as a workhorse. They're always editing. Yes, they're all, always they're <laughs> constantly doing something. Yep. Yes, and they're probably but they're probably going to have to help out on set, right? Because you're doing stuff. That's, that's the one day require. you're not editing. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I think at this point it makes sense from a tools perspective to to be at at two to three cameras. Um, just you know, a third camera doesn't bring as many options as adding a second camera to to a one camera setup. But you're probably doing enough now where you want multiple angles. So you've definitely got where whereas with the one person shooter they can probably work with one camera. You've definitely got at least two. Um, you might be up in like the Ursa Mini or FS7 type range here, but not necessarily mm -hmm. um some additional lights i think would help so you can do like the three-point lighting but also like backdrop light the space and, yeah. or the green screen or the backdrop or, or whatever mm -hmm. um i've only added one additional lav so that you could get two people talking at the mm -hmm. same time um and then you know i would add after effects um some experience with adobe audition probably makes sense yes um, just because, again, audio is so important. And so there's a lot you can do in Premiere or Final Cut. But if you know how to work Audition, 
<coughs> you're just that much better off. And then I think at this point, there's some kind of like project management software in place. Because if you've got the volume where you've got a three-person team coming in, there's multiple projects. They're all in different phases. Whether it's the person who manages this department or this kind of creative producer person, you know, they probably need to make sure that everything's being kept track of in that project man uh, that project management software. So I think that's something that is not necessarily a, a, a skill of the trade, but you know, just something that is required with the volume of work you're doing if you got three person mm -hmm. three people dedicated to video. Another so um where you you know where you said two to three cameras, I imagine that just being an evolution of the camera you may have already had at a one yeah. person team is yeah. kind of how we started and, and grew. Um, and most companies don't have the ability to go out and buy cameras, but if you yeah. do, um, those are certainly good options. Where, where I was going to go instead of spending money on the cameras, you got to have one or two. Um, but uh, say or at least just allocating some of your budget you're gonna run into a position into a couple of these videos especially if you're doing like series um <clears throat> where it's like the same host and they're on set you're gonna need a set design something you need to put a little bit of money into the set design and the space itself money should just be a tool for all of these yeah i mean it, it's not it's not it's super easy to make video and it's also not easy at all to <laughs> depends on what your expectations are i guess but um this is a loud chair yeah uh but yeah so like that and props come up here and there and when you're when you're at this level of production you want some of that stuff to be a little bit more polished mm -hmm. so you want to make sure your lighting is legit and you've got a decent camera that can you know has all the dynamic range that you might want so the images look nice you're gonna want a space that is quiet. It's not right next to the bathrooms. Um, one for the or elevators smell, or but also yeah, mostly <laughs> just the just the foot traffic and everything. Um, or the smell, and, and that it's you know, it's like a, a an actual space that your team can go to to do the work that they need to do. Just like everyone else has a desk on set is is a is a form of that for us. Mm-hmm. So, what's your dream team? When it gets to a full in-house team, I'm trying to think of a company who has this. Like, Lenovo, Lenovo. around here has one. SaaS has one. Yeah. Red I don't, Hat. I don't even know what they look like. But I, even, I don't know what they look like inside those organizations, to be honest. Um, I don't... Uh, I, I don't have anything necessarily prepared for this because I part of my thought was... If I were that big, I might be working with several agencies, and that like my in-house team would just augment some of that as well, or or vice versa. But mm -hmm. I think it's just with that many people, it's an ever-evolving list of people. Um, I don't know that you always have three producers and six MoGraph, and you know sometimes two people will quit, and then you got to put everything under one person's job and shift this person over a little bit. I don't yeah, know. I, I, I went less with number of people. I went with the roles that mm -hmm. I would want um, yeah, satisfied. I do remember my good point um, from a little earlier, so <clears throat> maybe we can edit that in somewhere here. But I think when it comes down to gear, um, maybe not at the one person team, but certainly at the three person team level, you should get whatever gear your team says they need. Because whoever you've got shooting is probably going to have experience with a camera that means mm -hmm. they're going to want a certain camera over something yeah. else. So, you know, I, I would say if you're, if you're considering an in-house team and listening to this episode, this is, these are guidelines for what you need to ask your team that, that you need to get them. So we're setting the expectation that you're probably going to need to buy one to three cameras. Um, but don't buy cameras and say to your team, here's what you need to mm -hmm. use you really need to be at the point where they can say, I'm going to need an FS7 mm -hmm. or I'm going to need a Nursa Mini Pro or mm -hmm. I'm going to need, you know, a, just a DSLR. So rely on your team for what they really need. We're making suggestions here if you were starting completely from scratch and basically just what to kind of prepare for. Um, in terms of the full house team, I, I've got I've got six roles. Um, I think if you've got a full in-house team, you've got – a lot of different types of production that are going on. You've got uh, a lot of 
production going on. Um, and it's it's pretty basic. Uh, you're going to need a producer or producers whose job is to manage the projects. I mean, chances are at this level, video is probably even a, a part of your offering. Like with SaaS, I imagine that, like some of this is like uh, implementation for new software that somebody yeah. just bought. I mean, this this is content that goes beyond marketing. Yeah, it's sales teams, it's FAQs, it's how to internal it's, communications. internal communications, recruiting, HR. So you've got your producer producers role depending on the volume of work you're doing, but that's a dedicated producer. I think anybody that can be involved in the creative is great, but I don't know that you necessarily need a creative producer. You need someone who knows how to get the stuff done. Um, you've got writers at this level, writer or writers who know how to write for video, and that's all they're writing for. Mm -hmm. You've got a director or directors whose sole job is to take a brief and turn it into actual video content, understand that vision, and direct the shoot. You've got a camera operator or camera operators whose job is to probably light, and so they're probably more director of photography types, but their job is the image. What does this stuff look like? Um, how is it lit? How are we capturing it? How are we executing the director's vision on this? Then you've probably got multiple editors at that point, mm -hmm. and motion graphics is again specialties so there they, they get very segmented they can yeah they can be um you could probably have one or two people who who can both edit and mograph but then you've probably got someone who's just a really good editor and just a really good mograph uh person um, i think at this point too with the tools you've probably got a studio in-house if you've got these kinds of resources mm -hmm. you've got your own dedicated space um you're talking about like from an editing standpoint you're probably on shared storage at this point like some kind of in-house server so that you know to your multiple editors and multiple mograph people can be working on stuff at the same time and don't have to be handing drives off that kind of stuff that gets into a whole thing maybe even like a dedicated editing bay at this point oh yeah um, yeah. You know, you could probably get away with cubicles for a one-person team and a three-person team, but at the volume you're doing with a, you know, a minimum six-person team, you know, you're going to want your editor, MoGraph people are going to want a space where they can just get away mm -hmm. and not have the noise of the office at, at that. So those are things that I don't know necessarily fit in the budget. It'd be great to have a studio and an editing bay for a three-person team, but, you know, it's it's... Once you get to that full in-house team, you really do need yeah, that stuff because they're probably shooting every day, Storage. if not a couple days a week. So there's, yeah. Uh, and then, of course, there's there's more gear because if you got the studio, you got all the gear that comes with the studio, blah, blah, probably blah. Probably doing blah, blah, some blah. stuff on location too, so like yep. a grip truck. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You could, you could have an entire, like, half-ton grip truck. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I, I think those are the I think those are the the key roles: producer, writer, director, director of photography, editor, motion graphic. I think, you know, and then you just depending on your workflow and the volume of work you're doing, you just have the right number of. You could have three editors and one producer. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So you know that would be my dream kind of in-house team. I How think. big do you think like the SaaS team is? I mean, I honestly don't know. Probably six to twelve people. It's weird how somewhere. they don't seem to circulate in the same community as much. You know, like there's definitely a film community, and well, I never I, run it. I think a lot of them just have enough. You, I, it's funny because you come across more of the Red Hat people. Yes, lots. Of um, and uh, well, but you know that actually leads to an interesting question: Where do you find these people? Where do you where do you <clears throat> find these people to fill out these in-house teams? Mm -hmm. Because I think uh, I, I would start with the local freelancer community. I would take the the video vendors that I've been working with, the one man bands, the other what, whatever I've got, and I would start with that network and just ask and just ask. Say who do you know anybody say, who's a full time? We're work. bringing this in house. Yeah. Don't worry, we'll have enough to, yeah. you know, keep some stuff coming to you. Or hey, or sorry, we're bringing it. this in house. Do you want the job? Yeah. Because because some you know not everybody's looking for a full time job. Sure. A lot of people have the misconception that freelancers want to get like are looking for something full time. Yeah, and a lot of freelancers like the flexibility mm -hmm. of being able to set their own schedule and, and do all that. So, but I would start with my existing freelancer network 
And if you like their work, one, ask them if they're interested. And then two, who do they know? Because the freelancers are going to know all the other freelancers. Mm. That's where I would start. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway. What, what about film school? Oy. What's the noise for? Um... I don't know. Film school, I mean, film school I would have just said the same a, thing, but do you want to explain it or should I? I you go, then I'll go. Film uh, school is not a necessity. No. Like, like, don't don't think that you have to bring someone out of film school. Um, I think people coming out of film school have an interesting um, foundation, but I've found that the people who went to film school and have spent time in, I'm going to air quote, the real world, especially when it comes to like video for business mm -hmm. film school is not about video for business film no. school is about like making movies yeah it's and, very and much about stuff like that documentaries and 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 so uh, yeah drama. And, and so i think the training Comedy. is different it is and i think somebody just out of film school would end up disappointed mm -hmm. in the work that they're doing it might be too much of a reality slap in the face um, not that not that video for business isn't fun and creative and engaging. It's just not what someone coming out of film school, I think, is looking for. Well, even in, even in growing storyboard media, we've interviewed or talked to a lot of people from film school, and what we do is just so not interesting to them. Yeah, yeah. They, they're, they're like, "What am I doing here?" Yeah, they want to. We're like, "What are you doing here?" Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're you're better off coming from business school, and yeah. if you're going to hire someone straight out of college, you're better off hiring someone with a marketing degree and teaching them how to shoot yeah <laughs> then you are or the other a creative way around. writing degree yeah yeah um the, but the yeah the the freelance community is a powerful tool that you could leverage and there's not there's no nothing wrong if you work full-time in a marketing department at a company to walking into one of those and saying hey we're starting in-house team curious if any you know and just start there and to talk to people yeah nice people they're not going to think you're weird or a traitor or yeah um, like a headhunter or anything. I don't know. Yeah, and, and even outside of freelancers. I mean, you're, you know, uh, we have worked with clients of ours on building internal teams. Mm -hmm. um, pulling from staff. Yeah, pulling staff. from existing staff, which is an interesting People who exercise. just had like knacks or hobbies in photography or wanted to learn editing yeah. or whatever. <laughs> yeah. I, the, and well, and I think that it's, there's a coalition of the willing you're looking for there, too. Yeah. Like people who, even if they don't have the experience, are, are excited about the opportunity to get into something new. Yep. You're going to get, you know, an extra three to six months out of them before they find out it's not right for them than someone who doesn't want to be doing that in the first place, um, if you have to go that route. Um, there are also... Um, you know, uh, companies around here like uh, Uncompany um, that works with a lot of freelancers. I think they do some in-house development yeah, and, they'll, and staffing. They'll, they're specialized <clears throat> in the creative they're space. Like a staffing agency where like you can get a four-month contract mm -hmm. with the software company and then that company can decide they want to hire, hire you full-time full yeah. or not and everybody has a choice in the matter. Yep. Um, the creative group is another mm -hmm. um, offshoot of <clears throat> Robert a, Half. Yeah, Robert Half, big, big staffing big, yeah. agency. Um, you know, and, and so they're, they're smart enough to have a division that, that focuses on, you know, those creative arts. What about, like, Production Hub and those other, like... Sure. Um, I, I, think, uh, I think those are woefully outdated, and it's hard to find quality content. I, I would probably go to... Um, LinkedIn or Indeed yeah. with a job post before I would go to Production yeah. Hub. I would go or, to LinkedIn and just look at who's your network. Even. Yeah, yeah. Um, so there, you know, there's. It's all about leveraging the network. It's all about just whoever you talk to. <clears throat> it's not necessarily about whether they're interested. It's who do they know that might be interested that you you know that you may have never even heard of. You know, a lot of I, th I feel like a lot of agencies they'll have that. You know, I forget what the legal terminology is, but you can't hire our people, we can't hire yours kind mm -hmm. of thing. Like a non-compete. But if you, you, there, you should also, if you've been working with an agency for a while, don't hesitate to ask them if anybody, you know, because sometimes people are looking to leave the agency world and go client yeah. side. Yeah. And if long as, as long as everyone's okay with it, then that's fine. So yeah. don't be afraid to explore that opportunity either. 
but also don't violate any kind of right. non-compete. Non You'll need to go through all the proper channels yeah. on that. Yeah. Um, okay, and I think we've already talked a little bit about how how you integrate them with your existing team. I think for your smaller team, your one person, your three person team, they're going to be working with a lot of your existing team mm -hmm. to get stuff done anyway. Mm -hmm. um, your your producer or director uh, is going to be working with your content strategist to understand how this video fits into an overall strategy. I mean, there's a, there's going to be a lot of, they're not going to just live on their own uh, in their own little bubble. There's mm -hmm. going to be a lot of, even if you've got a full team, there's going to be someone there who's responsible to, you know, for making sure that it aligns with the overall strategy and, and campaigns and messaging and all that kind of stuff anyway. And oftentimes, if you're the person putting these teams together, that's going to be your job to make sure that the content that the video team is producing aligns with the content that the social team is producing or, you know, the brochures team. Everybody loves that brochures team uh, is producing. So, yeah, anything you want to add on building in-house teams? Mm. Other than that, it's a horrible how about that, idea. How about that great? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Bottom yeah, line, don't do, do it. it. <laughs> Just hire us. Is that, is that what we're getting at? No. Um, <clears throat> Did you did you remember that great idea you had? Yeah, I'm gonna hold on to that one for later. Oh, it's that good. That's pretty good. Yeah, you gotta gotta stick around on the Instagram live to hear that one. I don't know. <laughs> I don't think it's going anymore. Hey guys, is the Instagram live still going? It's a 60 minute time limit. Ah. Ah. Last time we did it. This time we didn't. Yeah. <laughs> well, I guess everyone's now listening just to hear what they missed on the Instagram live. Yeah. So, okay. Should we thank our sponsor? Yeah. Um, Cozy Toes, which apparently are just socks. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you to Cozy Toes. <laughs> and uh, make sure to, you know, do all the downloads, subscribes, rates. We haven't gotten a, a review in a while. It'd be nice to have somebody come up with something, even if it's like an inside joke or something. Yeah. We don't have to get it. Yeah. <laughs> I... I <laughs> That is one way. Yes, <laughs> someone else's inside joke. Just make that your review. Uh, and, of course, join us on our next episode, which, uh, as of right now, is going to be about video trends for 2020. Um, 2020. It's like a new year. Oh, my God. Yeah, no, I think that one's scheduled for, like, December 23rd. Oh, do we have... We have... Wait, we have... What's this one? December 9th? December 9th. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. I don't know. It's just, just Whenever, to pull back the curtain. Today is Tuesday, October 29th when we're actually recording. This. I always find it interesting when people, I like to see what their lag time is. Mm -hmm. like, like if they mention, like, today in the news, you see whatever, and yeah. then you listen to it three days later. Did you see the, the, the Trump went to the baseball game and they chanted lock him up? Like, then you'd be like, wait, when did that happen? Yeah. Three years ago? No. That was sometime in the days preceding really Tuesday, did. October 29th. Melania is a she. No, I thought she was a Russian agent. Well, that's a that's a. Uh,